Retina Rounds, episode number 55, OCT Guidance for Macular Hole Surgery. In this case, presented by guest surgeon Dr. Eric Kiros from Mexico City, we'll show you how preoperative and intraoperative OCT can help with planning and executing macular hole surgery. Thank you, Dr. Kiros, for your contribution. Here's the patient's preoperative OCT, and you can see that Dr. Kiros has made a number of measurements on the horizontal B scan that's going through the macular hole. Now, there, there are many factors that you can look at for the preoperative OCT, and fundamentally what we care about are findings that can help guide our surgical decision-making, like what kind of technique are we going to perform, and to give the patient some information about what to, res what to expect with regard to successful macular hole closure and their visual prognosis. Now, obviously, factors like chronicity and other ophthalmic comorbidities are going to play a role uh, with respect to outcomes, but as I look at the OCT for this patient, a few features uh, stand out. First, the, the size of the macular hole um, is something to look at, and that's going to be defined as the minimum linear diameter, or MLD, um, and that does, that's the minimum distance between the edges of the macular hole. Uh, in this case, that's measured at 513 microns, so this is a, a large macular hole, and we're going to get more into the sizing of macular holes at the end uh, of this case. Uh, next, the edges of the macular hole are elevated, meaning there's a, a separation between the, the photoreceptors at the edge of the hole and the underlying RPE. Uh, and so we can say a cuff is present, and specifically a cuff is when the edge of the hole is elevated more than 200 microns from the RPE. Uh, and that appears to be the case here, uh, and that's going to confer a higher likelihood of closure. And next, the edge of the macular hole has uh, cystoid or hydrated changes, and that too is gonna carry a higher likelihood of closure. Uh, you can see that there's no ERM or epiretinal proliferation. Um, those factors can decrease the likelihood of closure. And finally, uh, we can look at um, a quantitative measure, which is called the macular hole index, or M MHI. Uh, and there are multiple indices uh, that have been uh, looked at for macular hole prognostication, but macular hole index greater than 0.5 can indicate both a higher likelihood of closure and uh, vision improvement. So the macular hole index is calculated as a ratio of the height of the macular hole to the base linear diameter, uh, which is the width at the base of the macular hole at the level of the RPE. So the base linear diameter, or BLD in this case, is measured at 1,730 microns, and it looks like the ratio of the height of the macular hole to the base uh, is going to be is greater than 0.5. Now going back to the size of the macular hole, we know that small and medium sized holes have a higher closure rate and that ILM peeling can increase the likelihood of closure. What about large or extra large holes? So this is a large hole uh, based on uh, the MLD measurement. Uh, and you can see from this table, which is taken from the CLOSE study group uh, publication in 2023, that both ILM peeling and ILM flaps have a high rate of closure and vision improvement. Although ILM flaps have a higher closure rate and ILM peeling appears to be associated with better visual outcomes. So for this case, I think it would be reasonable to proceed with either technique, but let's see what Dr. Kiros decides. At this point in the surgery, Dr. Kiros has already performed the core vitrectomy and peripheral shave, and you can see that he's using a brilliant blue dye or tissue blue uh, to stain uh, the ILM. Now he's using the intraoperative OCT to uh, visualize the immacular hole. Uh, and now using a pinch and, pinch and peel technique with ILM forceps, the superior edge of the ILM is being elevated. Uh, you can see that he's being uh, very gentle not to uh, create any iatrogenic trauma to the underlying retina. So that superior, you can see a superior flap is being fashioned uh, and that's being uh, draped over the macular hole and now the, uh, the edge of uh, what's already been peeled uh, is being extended uh, in, a, in a circumferential fashion around the macular hole. And so you can see that there's uh, this uh, smaller edge that's coming towards the, the macular hole and that the shearing technique, uh, that's, uh, that ILM is being removed. And now going to the edge uh, of where the ILM is still present, uh, the ILM peel is extended. This is really a very smooth, very beautiful uh, technique that uh, Dr. Kiros is demonstrating here. So now once the, um, the residual uh, ILM has been, has been peeled, the flap over the macular hole is, um, is draped, uh, and uh, now some viscoelastic is being applied over the edge of the macular hole, uh, over the ILM flap rather, uh, to keep that uh, flap in place. 
Now Dr. Kiros is using intraoperative OCT to confirm the placement of the flap. Now the flap is stained and you can see that it's draped over the macular hole, but uh, this, is, uh, this is a very uh, elegant use of the intraoperative OCT as just another uh, visual confirmation that the ILM is in a proper position over the macular hole. Now an air fluid exchange is being performed uh, and SF6 gas of a concentration of 20% will be implanted uh, into the vitreous cavity and the patient will be kept in the face down position postoperatively. Here's the patient's postoperative OCT at month one. You can see the visual acuity has improved to 2080 and the macular hole is closed, although there's still some uh, discontinuity of the outer, outer retinal layers and uh, still a small cuff of fluid uh, underneath uh, the now closed macular hole. Hopefully that will just improve with time. Here are some take home points regarding OCT guidance for macular hole surgery. Although pre-op and intraoperative OCT guidance were shown in this case, I think pre-op OCT information is particularly valuable. And there are many pre-operative OCT parameters that one can look at, and there are multiple publications uh, showing, uh, demonstrating various OCT indices for this problem. Um, this list of parameters to look at isn't comprehensive, but uh, these are some of the main things to look at on a preoperative OCT. So first, I think you want to um, most importantly determine the size of the macular hole, and that's going to be based on the minimum linear diameter, uh, which is the minimum distance between the edges of the macular hole. That uh, then will determine the size of the macular hole. Uh, and here, the table to your right is the closed study group's proposed categorization for macular holes. Um, small holes are, are less than 250 microns, medium uh, from 250 to 400 microns, large 400 to 550, extra large from 550 to 800, extra extra large from 800 to 1000, and giant holes are greater than 1000 microns. I didn't include all the tables and data uh, that are in the closed study group publication, but I'd highly recommend for all of our viewers uh, to take some time to read this really, uh, really important publication. But basically, ILM flaps perform quite well for large to even extra, extra large holes, um, and autologous retinal transplants appear to perform well for uh, giant retinal holes. So the size of the hole in this case can actually help uh, your decision making to some extent, although that's not the only thing you want to consider. You can look at the macular hole index, uh, which again is going to be the ratio between the macular hole height uh, and the uh, base linear diameter. And uh, macular, hole, um, uh, macular hole index of greater than 0.5 carries a favorable anatomic and functional outcome. Edge configuration, meaning whether the edge has a cuff or not, uh, whether the edge is edematous, um, whether there's a vitreomacular traction or an epiretinal membrane, all of these factors can provide information about the likelihood of success with surgery, and this information can be quite helpful when you're counseling patients. Now, there are many techniques for macular hole surgery, including uh, vitrectomy with and without ILM peeling, uh, ILM flaps, macular, uh, macular hydrodissection, uh, amniotic membrane, and autologous retinal transplants, all with varying degrees of complexity and risk. Uh, and the surgeon really, I think, needs to take into account all of the factors that we discussed, as well as patient-specific factors to decide which, pro which approach is going to be uh, the best uh, for the patient, taking into account all the risks and benefits. Now, generally speaking, I, I generally prefer a vitrectomy with ILM peeling, even for small, uh, medium-sized holes as well. Um, for larger holes, I'll consider either an ILM flap or, uh, or a wide uh, ILM peel. I usually reserve more advanced techniques like macular hydrodissection or amniotic membrane or autologous retinal transplants for failed primary surgeries. Uh, although an argument can certainly be made, especially for giant retinal holes, to proceed directly uh, to some of these more advanced te techniques, particularly autologous retinal transplantation. Again, surgeons are going to have a variety of preferences for how to tackle macular holes, and, and patient-specific factors can vary as well. So there really isn't a one-size-fits-all approach or a specific algorithm that you can follow uh, for macular hole repair. You have to take into account all of these factors and use your clinical decision-making to decide what's going to be the best for the patient. So thanks again, Dr. Kiros, for, uh, for sharing this case and giving us an opportunity to learn more about OCT guidance for macular hole surgery. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.